Welcome everybody to Reinvent Hollywood. This is episode number two and it's about the artist. Two weeks ago we started off this Reinventor series uh, with the future of the form and had a lively and interesting conversation. Today we're going to look at another really critical aspect to the evolution of the film industry which is the artist. Uh, our focal question for this whole series is, if we were to redesign the film industry today, what would we do? How would we redesign it to benefit the artist, the audience, and the business as a whole? So to do that, we have a stellar group of people that Ted Hope has brought us, brought together. Ted is here. Um, uh, unfortunately, he would be what I'm doing right now. He's in Amsterdam, and uh, technical difficulties has prevented him from his face being on the screen, but he's with us uh, on the on on the on the chat, um, and we'll be uh, helping direct the conversation on the side, and hopefully we'll see him uh, assuming bandwidth um, um, improves there. So we have um, I unfortunately don't know everybody like like Ted does, but I thought we would do a quick introduction for ourselves um, of of who's around the table, and then we'll start with our um, first conversation. So uh, why don't we start with Austin. Austin, a quick introduction. Um, who, who are you in a, in a nutshell and, and, and so forth? Hi, um, my name is Austin Cleon. Um, I'm an author. Uh, I wrote a book called Steal Like an Artist, uh, which is kind of a creativity book. And um, I wrote a book called Show Your Work, which is about how artists can kind of develop followings by sharing their process and using social media and the internet. Um, I have nothing to do with the film industry other than watching films, so I am the alien here. I'm the outlier. <laughs> Fantastic. Welcome. Welcome. Ted, are you, Thanks. are you, I see your face. Are you, are you operational? You tell me. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yay. Ted is here. Um, okay. Without any further ado, I will <laughs> The, um, the spotlight back to Ted, and Ted, perhaps you can continue the introductions about you know, who, who you brought together and why. Ted? Okay. Um, Paul, why don't you briefly introduce yourself? Uh, let's unmute Paul. Okay. Uh my, my name is Paul Schrader. I um, am a film uh, screenwriter and a film director and a on again, off again film scholar. Um, and uh, been at it about 40 years. I've been very, very interested in uh, following the arc of technology. And uh, so I guess that's my place here. Perfect. Welcome, Paul. Ted, <laughs> are you back? Y yes, but I've been fading in and out from Amsterdam, um, so I'm not sure where you left off, so I suggest oh. the introductions we continue as we were going. Okay, great. Minette, Minette, why don't you, why don't you welcome? Sure. Hi, I'm Minette Louie. I'm an in independent film producer based in New York, but I also, as of last September, run a new company called Game Changer Films, which finances women-directed narrative feature films. Um, we financed our first feature that premiered at Sundance this year. There's the poster right there. It's called Land Ho by Martha Stevens and Aaron Katz, which is going to be released by Sony Pictures Classics on July 11th. Um, but prior to that, I've produced um, nine independent feature narrative feature films. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Ted, you continue and while well that you can. Okay. Uh, Ritesh, uh, we're, we're lucky to have you join us today. Uh, perhaps we should continue with the self-introduction, though, so jump on in. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm Ritesh. I'm a writer-director, and I'm based between Bombay and, and New York City. I'm in New York City right now. I recently made a movie called The Lunchbox, and I'm also a new dad. So that that's really the the next next big project. Thank you for having me. And, and it should be noted that uh, the lunchbox is the the number one uh, foreign language film of the year in the United States. And uh, both before and after that, Ritesh has uh, 
made several short films and has been a participant to, uh, in many of the different creative labs that exist, both the Binger and Sundance and so on, right? Um, we, we are uh, incredibly fortunate to, to be joined by uh, a, a man that is one of the reasons I wanted to make movies, uh, Paul Schrader, uh, a, a man that, that in addition to uh, writing and directing some of the, the great uh, films of our time, has continued to make experiments um, in different uh, forms and methods of creating movies. Paul Schrader, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, Ted. Uh, you, know. uh, you, you, you want me to start off? No, we haven't finished yet. Oh, we, start, uh, we also have, have. We're waiting for Scott yet. Yes. So for the for those for those you know just uh, you know re recently um, P Paul did the canyons, which was a uh, incredibly interesting experiment in crowdfunding and micro budget production. Um, which he'll share with, and has had some uh, more recent adventures too that perhaps we'll, we'll hear about. Um, Scott Yaslow, chief film critic for Variety, um, avid uh, film fan, once my fellow host of Indie Night uh, at Film Society Lincoln Center, um, a man whose love for cinema uh, knows no bounds. Scott. What can I add to that? <laughs> Thank you for the the grand introduction, Ted. I'm your humble servant. I think as an interesting way to start off, you know. I thought we we missed Melissa. Oh, we missed Melissa. I thought I heard Melissa introduce herself. That was before we started. Oh, I'm sorry, Melissa Silverstein, uh, who, who continues to inspire me, provoke me, and. Um, Keep an incredibly important conversation going. The, the the founder and editor of Women in Hollywood blog on IndieWire, um, also the founder and uh, curator of the Athena Film Festival, um, a, a person who is has done uh, as much as anyone in recent time to make sure that the the challenging position of being a woman in this film industry is given ample voice and all of us can uh, consider the, the, the challenges that face uh, over half the population. I don't think I need to add another thing. I can go back to bed now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that intro, Ted. I'm happy to be here. All right. I think a good way to get started, you know, Austin is our resident outsider. Um, you know, per perhaps if you could address some of the what you've seen as the opportunities for creatives uh, in this changing world as different cultural industries uh, adapt to the, the digital transformation to kick it off. And then let's just go wild. Wow. Uh, thank you. Um, well, the, the, one, the one sentence that kind of sticks in my head uh, is something that my agent likes to say, and he says that all publishing is self-publishing. And what he means by that is, like, no matter whether you're, you know, what your distribution is or, you know, what, what your show is necessarily or wh whatever, it's always your job. Now, I think fundamentally the, the, um, the weight is on the artist now in a way that it hasn't been before, and, and I know that's kind of the theme of this, discussion, which is, you know, it's never been easier to get your stuff out there, to make stuff, to put it out there, but yet it's never been harder to kind of like make a living at it and have help, you know, and so I think in my world, uh, which is publishing, um, the big question is, you know, right now in publishing, you know, me personally, I have a nice mix where it's like, I run my own show online, I have my own audience, I can reach them directly. But my publisher, Workman, helps me get the books in Urban Outfitters or, you know, Barnes & Noble, all the, you know, and all the great indie stores around the country. So I, I think what I've found to be wonderful as a young artist is being able to mash that, you know, being able to reach your audience directly, put your work out, make it, have people see it, but also mash that with the muscle of like a, a big publisher, you know, but I know 
there's you know there's so many different models but I think no matter what your business model is having that direct connection with your audience is the only way I see to move forward and that brings with it its own challenges you know like artists haven't traditionally been the people who have to shield their own work and like make their connections and stuff you know so it's so I, I think it's a it's a funky time but it's you know it's it's a little scary but it's also great you know <laughs> How's that? <laughs> you know, I, I think that's uh, great. If I might uh, add to that a little bit, uh, you spoke about uh, how artists have to be the ones uh, showing their work and putting it out there. And and for me, as someone who just just made a first feature film, that's been uh, sort of I'm in my early thirties now, and I, I look back on it to my, in my short career and see that. It, it took a, a lot of discipline when I was in my 20s for me not to make a film. And uh, that almost became my goal as everyone else around me was, was trying to make a film. Because, you know, I, I thought I didn't have anything to say. And which, which in retrospect, I think is the, uh, is the only thing that I've done uh, which I'm most proud of is, is, is not make a film and not put out there in my 20s. Because I think even though everything changes, technology and it's... Uh, it's going to be a different world by the time my baby girl grows up. But I think the one thing that doesn't change is, is uh, from, from sort of an artist's point of view is that uh, the, the danger of everything that's happening around us is that oh, we still have to say things even if we don't have anything to say. Uh, so I think my, my sort of challenge is always how do I, how do I kind of hide and, and still be out there and, uh, and go away and re-emerge each time I have something to say, if, if that makes sense. Well, I wish more filmmakers or artists in all disciplines thought the way that Ritesh does, uh, mm -hmm. because that's the, the of course, the, the upshot of the digital age is that anyone can put their work out there. I remember at the, probably about 12 or 13 years ago now, uh, the great Iranian director Abbas Karastami said to me in an interview that, you know, now with digital technology, we'll know who all the greatest filmmakers are in the world, because anyone can pick up a camera as if it were a pen uh, and a piece of paper. But I think if he was being completely honest, he would have said, now we'll also know who all the worst filmmakers in the world are, because when anyone has access to a medium, there's very little quality control. And, and so what's happening, happening in a way with movies is what's happened with publishing, with self-publishing. You know, for every 50 shades of gray, there's you know, probably a thousand others that we don't know about that are out there online somewhere. and, and music and so forth and so on. So it becomes it becomes harder in a way to to sift the the separate the wheat from the chaff as it were. Yeah, I totally I totally agree with that. I mean it's uh <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> Man, throat. Um it, it, we have the technological tools to get our work out there and it's getting so much harder to cut through the noise and you know as a producer who is sort of a gatekeeper who has to sift now as the financier was another kind of gatekeeper you know I had to sift through so much work just to get to the good stuff on the bright side because of the technological advances you know I've, we've been able to discover some amazing filmmakers who made their films for two dollars you know who would never have otherwise been able to do, to do so ten years ago I mean, it's a fascinating time, you know, because of the abundance, the perversity of that is quite, quite the opposite often of what uh, Ritesh's, you know, uh, method has been. You know, I advise filmmakers quite often to be prolific, ubiquitous, and thus radically collaborative, you know, find new ways, new platforms to get their work seen because it's really hard to, to get uh, noticed you know, in the, in this world of abundance, basically, you know, if you're not funded, you have to yell louder, you know, be everywhere, you know, build your own network. Yet the flip of it is it also allows us to bring people to us. You know, so, Paul, you know, uh, I, I was very excited to see uh, what it was about 18 months ago when you chose to um, not rely on the, the studio methods to bring a movie together. Could you uh, talk a little bit about what that experience was like for you on the canyons? Yeah, uh, let, and and I, I'd like to move this conversation slightly different because I think something 
uh, is going on that wasn't even going on a year ago. Uh, you know, you know I've, I've watched as this changes. And you know, starting about 20 years ago, it was clear that the old technology could not survive, that the technology was too old, and the technology would change. And then it became uh, uh, more and more clear that the um, capitalist model was collapsing. And the idea that um, that pay as you go ticket taking was was now under assault, and then it became more clear that uh, theatrical exhibition was in danger. Now I just got back from Los Angeles and became aware of something else because 18 months ago, Brett Easton Ellis and Braxton Pope and I did a, a, a DIY Kickstarter film, which we part financed uh, ourselves and part financed with uh, Kickstarter. And I just had dinner uh, with the two of them last week. They're making another film now. And they are making it in five-minute installments. And Brett is writing it and Brett is directing it. And Braxton said to me, he said, for the first time, in my life, and he's about 40, he said, I no longer feel that feature film is in the center of conversation and that what we did 18 months ago, we, we, we can't do now and that what Brett and I are doing, are doing they've done uh, six of them now, they're each five minutes each, <clears throat> they haven't decided how to monetize them yet, they're in negotiations with the uh, uh, Microsoft and various other outlets, but you know, for someone who has devoted his entire life to the concept of the feature film, I have to admit I sort of agree with Bratton. I think the concept of the feature film is under uh, is an, is is becoming a more and more dubious proposition. Uh, people just don't have time for it anymore. And um, you know, that to me is probably the most, the biggest thing that's been happening in the last year to two years. And it's, it's interesting, you know, when you think through it, you know, we have the, these film schools, this huge industry that has been built up, Hollywood and the international cinema scene that exists for the support of the feature film form, which ultimately developed in its length partially as an economic model into itself, right? But if the if on one hand our culture now is is best represented by the abundance of culture, the, the converse of that is often what we have least of is time, right? You know, so if we're creative people, if we're generative generative sorts who want to get work seen and heard and uh, and responded to, you know, when you look at it, like Paul, so when you say that, when you, when you confront the situation of perhaps the collapse of the feature film form, as someone who has always been profoundly generative, who has created a huge body of, of work, what is your reaction to it? What? How do you wake up in the morning and say what you want to do? You've trained yourself in this long form feature film storytelling format, what are you going to do? Well, sometimes it takes a while to wake up. <laughs> uh, Ted, can I can I jump in for a second? It's yeah, Melissa. Sure. I wanted to say that, you know, one of the conversations that I have regularly with people is that women's stories have already are, are already missing from the feature conversation, only 6% of the movies, the top 250 grossing movies last year in the U.S. were directed by women. So what this new world is, is, is an opportunity for us to bring in voices that have been left out of the model that has existed in the past. And we, as we, as all people who are thinking about this move forward, have to think about how we include more women's voices in this conversation so that we tell all these, so more stories are included. 
And I wonder, you know, if that question, you know, both having seen, you know, Paul embrace Kickstarter for the funding of, of, of the canyons, you know, this conversation of short form, Ritesh having already developed a bit of a body of work in the short film format, you know, uh, do we start to see, is the opportunity for, let's use like the language of the internet since I'm living in Silicon Valley, the opportunity for rapid prototyping, for, for making small bets, you know, for, for gaining audience uh, response to the work in stages, you know, moving into stage financing, adopting what Austin, you know, pr promotes as, as showing your work and sharing your work. Does that offer an opportunity to expand the pool, to diversify the creative class and the audience, and with that, start to deliver stories for, you know, underserved audiences? Often when I get excited about the moment we're living in, it's that we're finally free of the, the mass market. We can deliver it to niches, and with that, hopefully discover audiences that haven't been served well by the film form. Yeah. Does, yeah, uh, let me throw something in here, because you know, over the years I've seen a number of authors attempt to become directors, from Norman Mailer to Susan Sontag to Paul Almaster, and they've always been defeated by the economics because their mindset was not in the commercial arena of cinema. But now, what Brad, what Brett Ellis is doing. He would never have done five years ago. You know, he is spending his own money uh, shooting this little episodic thing. You know, five minutes at a time. You know, that may be, you know, the new way for someone like Mailer or Sontag or Auster, who was defeated by the concept of commercial cinema to participate in audiovisual storytelling. So wait, is uh, Paul, is Brett doing this out of necessity, financial necessity, or is he doing it because he thinks it's it's a better format, this serialized format? Because it depresses me to hear you say that the film form is dead, which you know I don't necessarily disagree with. I just don't think that we should give Brett, up on it quite yet because it's such a perfected art form. Brett, Brett's doing it for fun because he writes them as he goes along. So he and, writes and a little I, you, I want to just a, jump, jump in this weekend. Um, this past weekend, we had a $12 million film make almost $50 million at the box office. It is a movie about a, a, a young woman's story. It's not directed by a woman, but, you know, we're okay with that. But so in certain respects, what's happening, in my opinion, is, um, or what I saw from this weekend was, again, going back to what Austin said at the beginning was, they had this mass amount of people who were organized around this guy, John Green's book. He has a huge following. Young women everywhere were hungry for this movie, and they just came out in droves. So a niche movie actually became a mainstream success in Hollywood. And yep. I think those are the kinds of examples that we have to use um, but, in moving things forward for the future. But, but Melissa, you know, we shouldn't mistake the idiosyncratic example for the overall trend. You know, 30 years ago there was a movie called Love Story, which uh, had the same impact as, as this movie does, and the same crowd and the same profile. What we're, you know, like with global warming, you, you can't talk about how hot is it today. You have to talk about uh, trends over time, and we are facing trends over time in cinema that defy what may be happening last weekend or next weekend. Uh, you know, so we shouldn't confuse, you know, something that happened to me yesterday with something that's been happening for 20 years. Uh, so as much as it changes, oh, please, Scott, go on. I was just going to say, I think that, you know, one of the, one of the issues that, 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 uh, that Melissa's hitting on is the fact that you know, when Love Story came out, which is closer to 40 years ago, you know, there was a wider variety of kinds of films being made within the architecture of the studio system. And now, you know, The Fault in Our Stars stands out because it's such an anomaly to have this kind of mid-budget, 
um, love story uh, made by a major studio and given that kind of push out into the marketplace. So I think that the question is, is, is you know, is, is it that the studios are following the trends or are they kind of imitating each other and thereby creating the trend where you only have one or two kinds of movies being made, uh, comic book adaptations, remakes of old movies, old TV series. I mean, I started to get a little bit nervous when you were having movies from not even 15 years ago getting remade. And and that's kind of the, the, the overriding climate now. So I think, you know, when one of these movies comes along, whether it's a Tyler Perry movie or it's The Fault in Our Stars, it, it does remind you that there are other audiences out there. And if Hollywood can figure out how to make a mid-range budget movie and not spend a hundred million dollars marketing it. We might gradually be able to go back to something more like the time when there were other kinds of movies we made. Yeah, that, that's my hope. That's my hope that's is that you know, budget. it's not just it's not just Megan Ellison that we're relying on to fund these movies that Hollywood used to fund. You know, with two hundred million dollars, I can make four hundred movies with that, <laughs> and it's sort of like I don't understand why. They're putting all their eggs in one basket. I mean, we had like so many tentpole failures last summer, and I, you know, Hollywood is just—I I don't understand. I just don't understand. Um, and you know, we independent filmmakers are forced to make really small movies under five million, under two million, under one million, um, and it's it's getting more difficult. Yeah. Okay. But with that as a model, right? If I can, just one second, Paul. You know, uh, you know, we watch the the bifurcation, right? Where, where it's these tentpole pictures. Hundred million dollars, and then the, all of the the rest of the folks working for next to nothing, right? We we see a new model with, with with Game Changer. We saw a new model with with the Canyons. You see success with the Lunchbox. You know the diverse audience, the diverse audiences are clearly out there. Fault of uh, stars, you know, demonstrating that time and time again. Yet, if anyone has read. Uh, um, the, the book blockbusters. We uh, we also see representatives uh, of the winner take all theory. Like that's what gets done. I often look to other industries, you know, music, publishing, art world, trying to find examples of that canary in the coal mine or the precursor of a new change. And I, I'm wondering, in terms of, of everyone, and perhaps, perhaps you know, uh, first with Austin as the non-film person. You know, do we see the, 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 those flowers blooming of, of new hopes, you know, in the feature film form? We see definitely some, some things happening in long-form television, serial. We see something in the webisodes that Paul brought out. But where can we also find the models that we might be able to emulate so we're not dependent on just the Hollywood system for funding tent poles? Let's assume that maybe they've abandoned the middle-budget films forever. What comes next? Yeah, I, I wanted to go back, uh, Ted, to something that uh, Manette was saying uh, when she asked, you know, why was Brett Ellis doing this? He was doing it because he's an artist and because it was fun. You know, he writes a five-minute episode, he ha has some friends, and they shoot it. And then, based on that, he writes another five-minute episode. Now, this is the same thing that Charles Dickens was doing, you know, uh, in Absolutely. the 19th century. And when Charles Dickens walked down the street in London, people would say, "Oh, I love, yeah, I love Pip. He's such a cool guy." So, you know, so Dickens would write more about Pip. Well, Brett is able to do this. If if uh, if Norman Mailer had the chance, I think this is what exactly what Norman would have wanted to do. And so, it's not a defeat to say that the feature structure is the best structure. Artists have been working in different structures for eons, and maybe this is the very best structure for Brett Allison because he certainly could not get a film finance. I think, man, uh, just like that totally resonated with me what Paul just said because I think what I'm interested – because this is all about the artist, I, I want to go back to what Ritesh said too is like how do I – you know, how do I make things and then still be out there? Like, how how do I how do I protect what I what I need for my process, but then also have myself out in the world connecting with the community? And I think what Paul is talking about 
to me, that is where the real opportunity for the artist is, which is how you, how you can figure out how all the social media and the new technology, how it can actually feed your art instead of taking away from it. And I think that's what is exciting to me. Like, how can we spin... Okay, you know, we, we're in this world now. How can we spin these things that seem like burdens like a lot like a lot of artists you know they think about keeping their audiences up and staying connected all the time as this horrible you know drain on their system how can we how can we twist that around so that it's actually like helping the art instead of hurting it you know excellent question <laughs> well i guess one of the questions that we should add is is being an artist a way to to live now. I mean, can you afford to do that? And I think that's what a lot of people are struggling with is, can I do this? Can can I pay my rent? And I think, you know, push comes to shove, sometimes not, sometimes yes. Well, I mean, Melissa, the short answer is, is no. Uh, you know, as Francis Coppola said, uh, every artist needs a day, do a day job. And said, so my day job is in the winery. Um, the, it is the unique artist who can actually make a living. Most songwriters, most musicians, most painters, 95% of all artists don't make a living. Uh, filmmakers have been accepted from this over the last 100 years because we operated under a capitalist model where you could only make films if the films made money. Now you can make films that fail. So it is now possible for a filmmaker to join the ranks of poets, artists, and musicians, who 95% of whom don't make money, a living. You know, I, rem I, I, I remember years ago seeing uh, Dennis Hopper uh, speak and say that only, uh, I think he said, the, the, the 3% or 4% of the Screen Actors Guild makes a living from acting. So, you know, now... Now this is the case of, of all people. There's just more people trying to be part of that three or four percent, whether it's in, in books, movies, uh, whatever, because the tools are so much more accessible. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely true. Just to give you an example, with specific numbers, my first Sundance feature, Children of Invention, was made for $150,000. I, as a producer, paid $7,500 for over three years of work because I self-distributed that movie. And it's it, it was a... <laughs> It was a nightmare, and you know, literally, it, you know, a week before we started shooting, I had to take a commercial producing job for two days, and then, you know, the week we were wrapping, I had to take another commercial producing job and take jobs doing budgets and boards. So it's really you can't make a living making movies. Um, it's it's very 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 difficult. I also want to go back to an earlier point of Austin's, which is that you know, social media, Twitter, you know. Facebook, this stuff is all great. It's great to use these tools. However, a lot of the directors that I work with have, aren't even on Twitter, aren't even on Facebook because it's so distracting and not everyone is built for that. Not everyone is built. Their brains are not wired in like multiple different ways where they can focus on their work to and, and, and you know, really concentrate on writing a great script or editing a great movie and then tweet also and so you know for example Patton Oswald this you know he's like a he was he's been a crazy tweeter and you know just last week he was like I am escaping Twitter for three months because I realized that I, my brain is being rewired and I need to get back to focusing on like the the artistic work at hand and artists need quiet space to work even producers need a quiet space to work and you know it's getting harder and harder because of all these fragments of content and you know especially now if you're making serial work you know and that's why I go back to you know the feature film is kind of a for me it's still the ideal artistic art form because there's a beginning a middle and end and you can conceive it in a, in a perfect circle and um, to do serial work is sort of like sometimes you have to artificially extend it you know everyone's talking how great TV is. It, it's great. It's a lot better than it used to be, but it's a plot machine, you know, and it's it's like it's like Cheetos to films organic food. So um, that's all I have to say for now. If I, if I may add to that, uh, I, I agree with everything that's been said, you know, but I think the one sort of common thread I think throughout everything is no matter what, what sort of art form we, we talk about, which will survive and thrive, it's, uh, we are talking about artists here, but but I think so much depends on the curators. I think in any, whether it's feature films or shorts or TV, I think really the the, the things that are going to thrive the most are, are the ones where are the greatest 
where the which have the greatest curators, you know, because uh, I had a very funny experience last year at Cannes. I was working on this film, you know, like like Minette for three or four years, uh, giving no regard to its distribution, but just to 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 the art, you know, the trying to make it the best film I could make it. But uh, we screened at the Critics Week, and I think about a day and a half later, Sony Classics came on board. And once they came on board, they, uh, we sold within 24 hours all territories uh, in the world, you know, because you know people people trust Michael and Tom's curation, and, and that just set, sort of set off this uh, sort of domino effect around around the world. And the, and the movies had a great journey. Uh, the point I'm making is that that. Uh, uh, really, the where, wherever the curators are, that audiences trust, uh, those those art forms will thrive. And I think, as much as things depend on artists and on producers, I think uh, I think really in this sort of cluttered world that we live in, uh, it's it's uh, uh, as an artist, I I want to be where the, the great curators are. I I agree with you. I mean, we had the same situation with Lan Ho, which is also picked up at Sony's Classics for a lot of money at Sundance this year. But your film, Lunch the Lunchbox, and Lan Ho, these are outliers, and we're lucky that a distributor like Sony Pictures Classics, of which there's only you know, it's basically Sony Pictures Classics and Weinstein Company and Fox Searchlight and A24 are the the distributors with cash that can actually pay for movies that we make, you know. But we can't use our films as examples for everyone else. I mean, you know, only a handful of films at Cannes, only a handful of films at Sundance get this kind of acquisition deal, you know. Um, so with Children of Invention, for example, we premiered that in 2009, which was right three months after the Lehman Brothers crash. So everyone had died, one or independent, Paramount Vantage, they, they all died. And so you kind of, and who knows what's going to happen, you know, next year. So you have to kind of always plan for a backup plan. So, Manette, did, did I hear you correctly when you said Sony Pictures Classics paid for a film? I'm <laughs> yeah, why do you think? I, I, I've, known, I've known those guys for decades. It's the first time I ever heard <laughs> them being described. They, as bought, they, bought a lot, they bought a lot of movies this year, the first half yeah, of the year. They don't actually pay for them. They, they, you know, I mean, they're, you know, the, 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 you know, Tom and Michael are bottom feeders. I mean, occasionally they get lucky, but yeah. you don't, you know, nobody gets rich uh, with Sony Classics. You know, the question, you know, the, the thing with Sony, who, who has been a, a great champion of foreign language film and, and American independent, you know, like, like everybody else, I, thinking through, you know, Ritesh's story, I can't um, help but think of, like, basically the movie I owe my career to. I made a film that um, no, nobody wanted, right? We, we got it into the Berlin Film Festival, but we had cut it on an avid. So um, it was the first film cut on an Avid, so the pixels were about the size of ping pong balls. We never got to watch it before we submitted it. Um, after we got into Berlin, I snuck it off to two different sales agents, told them they were the first to see it, and they both looked at it and said it had no market, that uh, this film would never sell to anybody. It was gay, it was Chinese, and it felt like a film from the 40s, except that it was gay and Chinese. It was Ang Lee's uh, film, The Wedding Banquet. It won the Berlin uh, Grand Prize. And uh, since no one wanted to sell it, James Seamus and I had to sell it ourselves. And we sold that $700,000 uh, movie for $3 million. And what that taught me what was that art, the artists, the audience, you know, um, and technology all move a lot faster than the business or the marketplace. That if we're always dependent on the curators, that the distributors, for what they think the marketplace is, we would just be telling stories that either have numbers after them or are the regurgitated tales of basically, you know, white uh, middle class privilege, uh, comedies of marriage and remarriage. How do we break out of that cultural? homogeny where it's always the same that is getting picked up, that people are basing it on past successes. How do we start to find something new and fresh? Austin, I think you had some thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, the thing I'm really fond of saying is that if you want to have fans, you have to be a fan first. 
And so one of the things, I, I actually have a film example, believe it or not. <laughs> um, I, I think you say his name, Mark Duplass, the Duplass, yeah. or is it Duplass? Plass. I so, say it both ways because I have a dead ear. Okay, so so one of the things, I, I, I don't know Mark, but one of the things that he does that I think is dirt simple but really great is he'll talk about like, hey, this great movie I like is on Netflix, you know, and it's just like on his Twitter feed, and he'll just be like, hey, that's a great movie, hey, that's a great movie, and I think at some point he even had like a 365 days of Netflix thing, and, and I thought that was so interesting. You know, Ritesh earlier said, how do I hide and still be out there, you know, and I think one way to do it as an artist is to just jump on and, and share something that you really love and to take on that role of curator yourself because the whole notion of word of mouth, that's what it is. It's people talking to each other. And so I think artists themselves need to take on that role of curator and, and share the stuff that they like. Yeah, I think the answer is that we just need better curators, basically. <laughs> yeah. and you had to sell the wedding banquet yourself, but it did then get bought by the Samuel Goldwyn Company for the American release. So they had the foresight to see that there would be an audience for this gay Chinese film that, as you yourself say, has its roots in the classic Hollywood movies of the 40s anyway. And I think a lot of times what we think is you know new or what gets bandied about is new in art is really uh, actually something that's very classical, that's very archetypal, but it's being, it, we're seeing it through the prism of a different audience. Uh, you know, we're seeing uh, 40s romantic comedy through a gay Chinese prism, and that makes it, you know, it's not a radical reinvention, but it is, it's, it's looking at something that's universal from a new angle. And I'm, I'm very much, I'm more, I'm more keen on that idea than I am, well, let's go out and do something crazy and reinvent the whole wheel, because usually and, that's and something like I just, a bad accident I just wanted to, in the 70s or something. To jump in as a curator, I, I feel like now my job I have two, uh, several curating jobs. Firstly, Women in Hollywood has grown to a place where I basically curate the information that we're putting out there and have people write guest posts. And I'm really always looking for new voices. But one of the things that we decided not to do on Women in Hollywood is to post people's Kickstarters campaigns because just because you can doesn't mean you should. And it really needs to be about the stories. But secondly, um, I, I curate the Athena Film Festival, and what I say to people, because we live in a world where we only see mostly men on screen, is that you can come to our festival, and you will see women on screen for an entire weekend. And it's almost like a revolution to people, a revolution and a revelation, because being able to make that proactive decision to see women, and we show new movies, old movies, um, a past year, films that have played at film festivals or show works in progress, all these different things. And we are curating a weekend where we talk about women and we talk about women's leadership. And I think these kinds of niche things are what are making people excited about art. Um, Ted, I, I, like, I, I like to respond to a comment that you, uh, you wrote on the screen. You said, we vote with our dollars for the culture we want, right? Okay. Um, I, w I wish this were, were true, but we we have now raised an entire generation that doesn't want to pay for what it, what it gets. I mean, uh, I I still buy uh, songs on iTunes because I think that's what one should do. If if, if what, but uh, you know, no one else does. Uh, I was just talking with David Byrd, and he said, you know. None of my friends pay for music anymore, uh, and we had, and that's going to be the new film generation. Nobody wants to pay for anything. So, h how does capitalism work if everybody thinks it should be free? Now, it, it's an ex it's an excellent point. You know um, that back in the days of, of you know when the village was filled with music shops, I spent my weekend going and buying CDs, and I spent more money on CDs. Then I spend on hard drives, and now I spend money on hard drives. And frankly, I was happier when that pursuit uh, of new music what was a hunt, and I would find it and put it on, and it wasn't necessarily driven by an algorithm along the the, the way. You know, I'm always reminded of uh, the 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 March Hare in um, Alice in Wonderland, 
right? The March Hare said, I, I like what I get, right? He didn't say, I get what I like. He said, I like what I get. And, and he that made him content. Audiences are built. We're trained to respond to, to certain types of storytelling. When we get a diet, you know, uh, of male protagonists, you know, crime fighters, we become accustomed to that. The question I often see, you know, like I remember very well a friend of mine, an, an actor who spoke, you know, to me of, uh, you know, he was, I think, tripping at the time, and he came to me and said, don't you see it, Ted? It's Ang Lee. He's the angel. In Good Machine, that's a God machine. And you, my friend, you're the hope. And our job, you know, is to, to as artists, is to tell everyone to look way over there, look far to where, what could be. How do we drive them? And I and I and I wonder that about that regularly. You know, that 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 I respond to what's fresh and new. I ask for cinema to deliver new worlds to me. I ask to to have this incredibly unique experience uh, of a shared emotional response with strangers in the dark. You know, but yet the film industry is a business. As artists or in, folks in any creative field, how do you drive it forward yet seeing the constraints of everything being based upon an economic model? You know, uh, if I could, I may add to that uh, and also to what Austin and Melissa were saying. Uh, I, I loved Austin's film example of the Duplass brothers. But one thing that came to mind was that the Duplass brothers also helped to sort of launch uh, the dramatic, serious sort of acting career of Jonah Hill. So, you know, it, it speaks to the ability of the niche to impact the mainstream like it has been before. Uh, so I think uh, even, even while we are working in, in, the, in sort of these niche worlds, you know, we have an ability to impact the mainstream like, like we never did before, maybe five years ago or ten years ago. I think that if the question is about for artists specifically, you know, how do you work without being, you know, uh, so uh, restricted by the, the quote-unquote business, it's, it's going back in a way to what we were saying earlier is whether, what, what your aspirations are. I mean, as Paul says, you don't have to be a financial success anymore to make movies. But if you want to survive, then you might have to have a day job. Like, you know, I thought it was very interesting when Kelly Reichard, who has a movie out right now, Night Moves, uh, said to me in an interview a few years ago that she doesn't consider herself a filmmaker by profession. She considers herself a teacher. She teaches at the film school at, at Bard uh, College. And that uh, she makes films as an as a artistic endeavor when she can and when she can find the money to do it. And, and that that's set her free in a way as an artist, to not have to worry about the financial implications of what she's doing. That she, she spent her time in Hollywood trying to make movies there after her first feature, uh, River of Grass, and that completely turned her off of, of wanting to operate within the system. But I think the system is always going to be there to some extent or to a large extent, and there's always going to be people who want to work in that. There's always going to be people like Ang Lee who start out making small low-budget movies, but who have the desire to make films on a very big canvas for huge audiences all over the world. And I think artists have to decide who they want to be as an artist and then sort of, you know, proceed from there. It's not open to everybody, though. Both, both uh, Manette and Melissa have spoken about this, how this year we've seen about five examples of male directors who get to make the leap from uh, making, you know, a five hundred thousand dollar film like Monsters, and then they get to make Godzilla, right? Where are the examples, you know, uh, uh, of other of other genders uh, do, doing that? It's well, not I, open I, to everybody. I, 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 I'm sure. I'm sure someone is offering the director of Bell a very nice job right now. It's offering who? The director of Bell. Yes, she actually has a studio job. Ama, um, Ama Asante. Ama Asante is, is now working on a studio picture, but she's also working on... But they actually, she got that job before Bell came out. Yeah. Hey, uh, Austin, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious, Austin, that, that you know, uh, looking at, at the kind of history of artists and creative work, you know, as you do in, in your books, what other examples you see uh, uh, of folks, 
you know, not being, you know, when a system collapses, other ways of moving things forward? Oh, um, I mean, the art and commerce thing. It's like, you know, I mean, for me personally with writers, I mean, there's always been a super rich history of writers with day jobs. You know, I mean, you've got someone like Philip Larkin, who was a great librarian. You know, Wallace Stevens uh, was the, I think he was the vice president of an insurance company, you know. I mean, my favorite... William Carlos Williams. Right, a, a doctor. It's like, I, I mean, I think the thing that I don't hear a lot about, what I think is tricky is, I mean, my my favorite quote, on this is from Bill Cunningham, the photographer, in that wonderful documentary, Bill Cunningham, New York. He says, if you don't take money, they can't tell you what to do. And one of the things I've been interested in, you know, we're talking from, uh, from an artist's perspective, is you can take the studio's money, and that's one thing. What happens when you crowdfund, and all of a sudden you've taken money from 5,000 people? Do you have five thousand bosses now? You know, it's like what what happens with crowdfunding? Because there's this interesting thing that happens where, um, you know, I think some artists feel like now all of a sudden they have this pressure to please the people that have given them money. You know, so I wonder, you know, that whole. To me, what's interesting is that you know financial freedom in some ways can lead to artistic freedom. I guess. I mean, yeah, I think that's an interesting point. You know, Paul, uh, you say people don't want to pay anymore for, for content, but uh, maybe it's just that they pay in a different way. I mean, you had a very successful Kickstarter campaign for the Canyons, and then we've seen other, other very successful campaigns, whether it's Spike Lee or Veronica Mars or the LeVar Burton Reading Rainbow campaign. So people are, uh, you know, willing to pony up if it's something that they – they want to see. So maybe now, you know, we're entering in the era where people are going to pay to be, in a way, producers of the content that they want rather than simply consumers. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> there was a really, um, I, I would recommend, you know, there was a really great piece by David Carr in the New York Times yesterday about this. And one of the points that he brought up that I thought was really smart is he said, you know, it's just like Ted said, you know, it's like people will pay to go see people live. They'll go, they'll pay to see musicians live still, and they'll pay for three hundred dollar headphones and and the and like a five hundred dollar iPad, iPad or whatever, but they won't like pay for the actual music. And I, I think that's interesting. You know, uh, my, my one of my friends uh, was going to do a Kickstarter where he was going to have a live band. To, to go along with his movie. And I thought, you know, maybe that's where the chance for opportunity is, thinking about, you know, looking to music and thinking about performance and how can we make the cinematic experience something that people want to shell out for, you know, yeah, uniquely. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Austin, it's only a few years off, but very quickly we will be able to download a movie in the speed that you can now download a song. And that, you know... That would be a seismic change. You know, it, it's kind of curious. Like, I, I'm here in Amsterdam uh, right now, and I was brought out uh, to, to talk to filmmakers from uh, both the area and actually around the world about the idea of the artist as entrepreneur, that the artist being the owner-operator of their work and embracing some of the lessons from business culture so that you can support yourself, sustain yourself, pursuing the work that you love. Yet at the same time, I was warned that if I was to say, you know, art is business, I would have tomatoes thrown at me, you know, in this culture where the where, uh, subsidy system ha has allowed a defense against the cultural onslaught of, of, of Hollywood, you know, and how people respond. I mean, generally speaking to the folks, should artists be involved in business? Should they take the responsibility for their work to make sure that, that uh, they, they look at different revenue streams? Should they do, as, as Austin you know, mentions, learn how to eventize their work to make it bigger, you know, uh, bring more showbiz uh, you know, to it? Is that the responsibility of the artist, to make I, sure their I, work is seen? 
this is where creative producers like myself come in, I think. You know, I, I take great pride in protecting my directors, in, in the film world anyway, from all of the, the marketplace pressures and realities because, you know, I do believe that, you know, as I said earlier, artists need a quiet place to work. They, they can't let um, their edit decisions, their script decisions be driven by the market. They can't guess what the audience is going to want to see because what the audience wants to see changes minute by minute nowadays. So it's like, what story do you want to tell? What do you want to convey? And that has to remain pure, and you have to shut out the outside world, I think, from that. And so that's where producers come in, and producers are the people who, who are the translators between directors and audiences, between directors and investors, between directors and distributors. Um, so but, that's... But on the same time, you know, people have an, a, a, an emotional connection with, with the musicians that they see on screen, right? Yeah. I would like to buy, go out and be able to buy the, the Paul Schrader doll or the Ritesh that, that doll. I, I, you know, I want a deeper emotional connection to, to the artist behind the work. How can we Absolutely. Do that? That, that, that's not to say that, you know, Ritesh and Paul will have to go on tour. Like, you know, I would make them go do the Q&As and do the press. You know, they want to talk to the director. They don't want to talk to the, the producer. Of course, that's part of their responsibility. But, you know, as far as, like, all the back-end coordination stuff, I think that, that belongs in the realm of the producer. And I think that, you know, Paul and Ritesh should focus on speaking about the work. Paul is available for party rental, say. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, I wonder, you know, like, you know, you look at the example in the music world, right? And the, the real reality is they learned that their business wasn't a replicable, uh, wasn't based on creating a replicable product, the CD, but it was based on a authentic event, the concert, and merchandise, right? You go to any, you know, music festival and they have a merch tent, but you go to a film festival there's no merch tent there, right? You look at Kickstarter and people are selling, you know, lunches and dinners and script consults with their actors and with themselves. But I don't go to a festival. I want to have din dinner with Ritesh after seeing Lunchbox. You know, can I buy dinner, you know, for $1,500 like you would on Kickstarter? Maybe if there was a, a, a merch, you know, tent, he would be sitting there, live Kickstarter, live crowdfunding, you know, and I can buy lunch from Ritesh. Are you going to uh, start to pimp yourself out? I'll, I'll do it for $10. <laughs> hey, 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 here's an interesting example from another audiovisual business. Um, because of the canyons, I made friends with uh, James Dean, who's a, a porn actor, and I had dinner with James recently. And that business has fallen off 50% because it's all free now, eventually what's going to be happening to films. You, anybody who pays for pornography is a fool at this point. Uh, and he makes more money now on merchandising, his name, his brand, his products, than he makes uh, as a performer. So, uh, so I, I guess that's where we're all headed. <laughs> yeah. I, I miss that, Scott. Hello? What, what is that? Uh, we're, we're, we're breaking up, I think. Oh. Yeah. I, 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 I didn't hear you. Well, the, the, question I, I, the, the question I wonder, though, is, you know, so, so Manette, the producer li lives there to protect the, the, the artist from the demands uh, of the, the marketplace. We are the, we're their a, buffer. We, we, can, we translate the market for them and, you know, Try to protect them as much as possible so that the art can remain pure. But I think uh, the, point, the point is, Ted, that, you, that, that deserves a little bit more exploration is you're in Amsterdam. And as, as you point out, you have in Europe uh, a, a government subsidy system for making films that makes it much easier for people to make more different kinds of movies than you can make in the American commercial studio system. And I, and, and I think the thing is that whether you have, whether you're doing it yourself or you have a creative producer like Minette as your intermediary, if you're making movies in America, you have to kind of be down and dirty with the, with the money in a way that you don't necessarily in a system where the government of the country is invested in art in a way that they're not here. And that doesn't just apply to 
filmmaking is why it's all the arts. We don't think our tax dollars should be going there in this country. And that's a well, huge Speak for yourself. I think I might uh, weight my, my tax dollars a little differently than the way the government chooses. And it brings up the question is, you know, what is our responsibility both as creative people and, and uh, as citizens, right? That right now in America, you know, the cost of education is so high that if you chose to go to art school or pursue a degree in cinema studies, you know, you have such debt that you'll have to go into banking, right? You know, so, so it kind of sometimes feels like a system that, that, that's rigged. You know, should, I, should we have a different price for an education in, in the arts than we have for a price to earn a, a, a business degree? I think this is where artists really hurt themselves um, because I think that when we talk about you know subsidizing the arts I think there's a bigger issue and I think a lot of artists would be better served to just argue for a universal living wage and universal affordable housing and universal affordable education. I really think this is the part where artists kind of like if we say that like we are special and we should be afforded these things, these are things that everyone in America should have. They should have a living wage. They should have access to affordable housing, good health care, and, and education. And I think that that's the kind of thing where I think arts, artists in particular do themselves a disservice when they say it should be for us. It should be for everyone. And then if you want to make films on the, you know, then, then, See, I, I just think it's like if, if, if the universal aspect of that was taken care of, there would be more uh, ability on the part of artists to, to make good work. Certainly, and maybe well, that's why there isn't. You know, may, maybe the government has decided or certain powers have decided that if we, if we don't allow that to happen, we won't have any of these subversive types making yeah. films. Yeah, because well, w w whatever Austin is smoking, I'd like to have some of it. <laughs> But I also wonder, you know, in that same way, is it the responsibility of the artist to make sure certain stories get told or certain other creators get to speak? You know, we certainly see other countries with sometimes directors are imprisoned, you know, but at the same time here in this country, you know, as Melissa pointed out in the beginning, it's only 6 or 7% you know, uh, of, the, uh, of the director class in, in the fiction world that gets to, to uh, be female and direct films, right? You know, it, it's absurd. You know, um, is it the responsibility of other artists to make sure that there's greater diversity in the field? No, it's the responsibility of financiers who are financing these films, and which is why Game Changer was founded, so that we could specifically look at films directed by women and support them as artists so that they can tell the stories that they want to tell. I mean, it's a whole half of the population that's completely being ignored in, in, the, in the mass media. You know, and that goes for people of color, it goes for older people, it goes for handicapped people as well. Um, I mean, one of the films as a producer that I've had on my slate the longest is a film with a black lead and an Asian American lead. And the, you know, third and fourth characters are white guys. And it's been impossible to finance, you know? And, and, and it's, it's, it's the, it's, and I think there's this perception that, yeah, you know, films with people of color and it films with starring women will not make any money. And, you know, you go to sales agents and you go to financiers and you go to studios and they'll, t they'll all tell you the same thing. Can you please make these characters white so that we can try to make some money off of this movie? And it's very, very frustrating. And, and it's just, it seems that people have this, like, false narrative in their heads. Like, this is not something that is real, but it keeps getting perpetuated because in the data that comes out from the MPAA and from all these people, it shows movies that are geared towards the Hispanic market that have Hispanic characters are bl blowing up. Movies that have women in them are more successful. And so it's like, in some ways, we I don't know how to debunk these myths, but which I do well, every you, single day. You know, 40, yeah, 40% 40 of all millennials are people of color. And, you know, at the upfronts at ABC a few weeks ago, they greenlit the very first Asian American show in 20 years, uh, fresh off the boat. And, you know, all these all the Asian Americans are rejoicing about that. And, you know, there's all this discussion. Created by a woman. 
created by an Iranian American woman from Hawaii, nice. directed by Lynn Shelton, the pilot, which is it's right. awesome, you know, all around awesome. And um, the whoever the head of ABC is or whatever said, you know, this is a business decision. You know, forty percent of millennials are people of color, so we need to start catering to these people. Um, so it all comes down to the bottom line. But see, Minette, the people at ABC see that women and people of color are successes because of what the Shonda Rhimes model has created at ABC. So right. as soon as, and this is what they believe are successes because they've seen it and they're making a fortune off of it. So it's like this, once people get it in their heads that these things can be successful, then they, they start to green light other things and look for other things. So it's just like yes. we have to get it into people's heads. Well, that's exactly it, Melissa. I mean, I, I was talking last year around this time with Justin Lin, uh, who made the Fast and the Furious movies, and he said that uh, when he first uh, was taking meetings in Hollywood, and even after the first Fast and Furious movie that he made and he was taking meetings, he could feel when he went into the room that to the studio executives and the producers, whoever he was meeting with, he did not look to them like a director. Because to them, a director was a white older man, you know, and not With a, a young, baseball hat. Asian American kid in a baseball. Paul is not wearing a hat. He doesn't have a hat on. So so that's what it is. It's just about the the, the gears of change are slow to turn. And and you know, when somebody like Justin Lin comes along and has the kind of success that he's had, he'll make it much easier for the next person after him and the same thing like you say that Shonda Rhimes and whoever created this uh, this fresh off the boat show and you know, maybe if we're having this conversation in 20 years, we'll be looking at a completely different landscape. But it's it, it, these things never happen overnight, unfortunately. Yeah. The um, I mean, the, my, my first film, which was in the 70s, was with the two black guys and a white guy. And I remember every meeting I walked in, they said, oh, you, you must be mistaken. You must mean two white guys and a black guy. Uh, you know, but that said, I don't um, feel... Uh, I should feel guilty. I mean, as a filmmaker, I should hire uh, minorities and women. I should see their films. But if you want me to give up my green light so they get to make a movie, I ain't doing that. <laughs> you know, uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll just have to make a better movie than yours then and then win that financing from you. It's <laughs> Ash. No, uh, I was just going to add, coming back to what you were saying about what the responsibility of an artist is, uh, I think more than ever, maybe it's just that, that, that no matter what stripe you come from or what race or whether you're a man or a woman, your responsibility now more than ever is to make universal stories, you know, to find the universal heart of a story, whether, whether you can do it in hiding or in public view, I think that's, that responsibility is, is greater now. Than, than it was before. Uh, it's it's about how how we can travel from you know from being within our niche to across it. Uh, I, I I was talking. You know, it's curious. You know, I I was talking today to uh, a, a female filmmaker, and you know, on um, on one hand, I've always you know practiced exactly what what you said, Ritesh. I've always felt that actually you know one of the great things about cinema and storytelling and you know the arts in general is it helps us broach really difficult subjects and myself I often find that that I'm able to do it better when it's somebody that that is very different from myself a, a more difficult uh, subject is often I, I can confront it in a true way I let down my guard when they might be a different race or a different gender or a different age or a different class than myself. I'm somehow able to find that universal heart. So, you know, I used to joke, you know, after we made The Wedding Banquet, when people would ask me, you know, should I make my films for an English market, for an English, lang in an English language to hit a wider market? And I said, no, my most successful film has demonstrated I should make all my films in Mandarin, you know. And, you know, your film, Lunchbox, was very universal. You know, and I wonder sometimes, though, if it was the cultural specificity that allowed people to feel that sense of longing, you know, um, you know the, the, the misconnection of, uh, of love along the, the way. Does that, does that actually help? You know, people talk often about, you know, how 
originally hip hop music, you know, was looked at a, a, as you know a, a, for the African American, but of course it's the the, the wide, you know, the fact that it's a global phenomenon. It did not get stuck in the way people say that, you know, black film can't travel. You know, hip hop is global more so than anything else, and people find what they relate, you know, to in it. You know, how do we we start to to feel that? I was talking to this uh, female uh, director today who said, "No, Ted, uh, that doesn't happen." People get programmed to see people as they're represented on the screen. You know, she was a successful director. She says she goes in to do a Hollywood pitch. They go, no, it's a female protagonist. We're not going to do it. But will you go out and have a drink with me afterwards? They see her a as a, 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 you know, sexual <laughs> conquest. You know, that, that, you know, that, that she was saying, you know, studies show that basically Americans frequently when confronted with an on-screen character of a different race assume that they're the bad guy, assume that they're the enemy, you know, so it's a long process of breaking that down. I agree with you, Ritesh, but man, it's hard to break down those stereotypes. It takes a long time to make change, and that's what we're doing in some ways. You have to think about it as we're trying to make some culture change here and getting people to think about, Ritesh used the word universal stories. Well, lots of people, when they talk about the word universal stories, they don't necessarily think that women, stories about women are universal. Well, hi, we're 50% of the population, so I think that our stories should be seen as universal. I'm, I'm kind of curious with everybody, you know, that, you know, if, if you were starting out today, or if your child was about to enter a career, you know, in the arts, particularly the cinematic arts, what advice that you would give them, you know, how would you recommend that they go forward? I would ask my child to marry a lawyer first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, but, you know, I, I, am, I am starting out today, so I am more in need of that advice than, than giving it. But, uh, but, you know, to come back to, to where I was saying, I think it's because we have so much at our disposal, so many platforms to speak from, uh, I think it's, it's all the more necessary now to, to speak through our work uh, than, than to purely speak through those platforms. But that's just, just my sort of useless, useless advice. Yeah, well, I mean, I... Um I got lucky, and I walked in the door in 1968, and the door was open for about 10 years, and a bunch of us walked in. The door is closed now. Um, I don't think I could get in anymore uh, into the commercial industry. I could get into the um, advocational, a, a vocational rather, uh, side of art, but uh, I would certainly not recommend uh, anyone who um, had financial concerns to get involved in audiovisual art. There's probably more, uh, more artists writing code than there are uh, making movies. <laughs> I, I usually tell people they should do it only if they can't imagine doing anything else with their life. Because clearly it's not a growth industry um, in an economic sense. So I think, uh, you know, it's, it's better for our audience if the people who are the most driven and the most passionate about it do it. And, and you know, we, we don't have people making movies just because they think it might be cool to make one, you know. And I do think there's been a little bit of, a, of, a, of too many of those that have been accommodated by the ease of making movies today. Yeah, and also by the economics of film school, which is, is, is there's a real racket, you know, of graduating all these kids for whom there is no job, just because the film school is the cash cow of every university. Yeah, except to say that there are people who graduate film schools, you know, to do things other than direct movies. I mean, we do need a steady infusion of talented editors, cameramen, sound editors, and so forth and so on. And I think film schools... I mean, as, as a graduate of USC, which is probably one of the most industry-geared film schools in America, uh, there, there's definitely something to be said for going somewhere where you can study a craft in the way that you would study, 
you know, mechanical engineering or something like that. So I, I, I don't want to, you know, throw the film schools out with the bathwater just because they they may attract too many people who think they, they want to direct and, and actually aren't very suited to it. I would just add, if you have to, if you, you if you really feel compelled to do nothing but make movies, then you need to develop a marketable skill to, or you know, some you need you need to have another job, and you need to be able to have a lot of stamina to juggle both filmmaking and working your day job. And I tell filmmakers, or I, I think filmmakers really need to know how to talk about their work um, before they sell it, and also after. So when you're trying to publicize your movie, you really need to know how to talk about it and so that we can connect with you. You, you know, it, it's it's a uh, I, I wrote an intro to this about the kind of paradox of the times. You know, on one hand, it's very hard to support yourself. You need that second job. But on the other time, the other on the other hand, I think we're freer now than we've ever been. We don't have to make movies for the mass market. We don't have to make movies that are limited by the feature film form. We have billions, it seems, of platforms available to us to distribute our, our, our work. We can connect directly with our audiences and turn them into communities. You know, uh, we can create as often as we like or as seldom as we like. You know, it seems on one hand it really is the best of times. Uh, you know, I think uh, if you can hear me, I think I'm not muted. Yes. But uh, but I think you're right. One other aspect of, of it being the best of times is that also the world is becoming less esoteric. So you know, while we say that you know see that as a bad thing, I think for filmmakers it's actually a good thing that there's billions of people in India and China that are getting exposed to things that they didn't get exposed to. So while that is killing some of the traditional values and traditional sort of systems in the societies, it's, it's bringing on board millions and millions of people who can now access and understand stories from different parts of the world. Uh, I think it's a huge opportunity, opportunity for us to tell, you know, those stories, make those stories travel in the West and, and for stories in the West to travel there. Uh, I think it's a great it's a great time to be a filmmaker actually. Yeah, I think another piece of advice I give to a young filmmaker today is is learn Mandarin because uh, I was talking to a producer the other day, a very established producer with many decades of experience in the indie world, who is working now to make uh, movies in China, movies for the Chinese market with Chinese stars because there is money there. There are people who are willing to make movies, and there is an audience there that will go see movies that are not just blockbusters. So that is there's money, that, Scott. I will add, there is money there, but there's no taste there yet. I've had opportunities to make movies in China. I've talked to Chinese investors. I speak Mandarin and Cantonese, and I think a lot of the the worst qualities of Hollywood, all the star fucking aspects, are are like multiplied by ten in China at present. So I think they need a a sort of re-education in the artistic realm. Based over there. That could be maybe in the sequel to Land Ho. They go yeah. To China, of Land Ho goes to China. <laughs> well, the Don't give up hope, though. I, I think that we've seen, like, for instance, in India, which, you know, has one of the most robust film industries a a anywhere, that uh, of recent times I've seen more and more what I would call independent Indian films start to get generated that had no Bollywood element, you know, that took, you know, uh, big creative uh, risks and leaps. And I, you know, and I certainly see a great number of great, you know, some of my favorite filmmakers of today, you know, are coming out of China. So th there's a wide variety of stuff. But like I would argue, again, a as artists, you know, here in America, the great thing is we are free to exploit people as fully as we want, right? How does independent film get made? Independent film is a crime. It's ultimately against the law in terms of labor laws and what we do in order to get these movies made, right? But we get to make them in America and they get to be seen. If you were a filmmaker working in China right now, you couldn't tell contemporary stories uh, readily about what the situation was. Right? And what, yet, when you read about American filmmakers in the studio system, 
making movies in China. Uh, when you hear about studio people talking about China, they go, oh, the, the government censorship, that's just a, like working with the studios. It's the price of doing business. That's not true. We choose whether we want to work in that business arrangement with the studios. The people in China live in China. That, that censorship is much different. And I would argue, as artists, as creative people, it is us to stand up and say, no, you know, that, that is not right. You know, we have to uh, eradicate censorship wherever we can and allow for the free exchange of ideas. The, uh, well, Scott, you know, the, uh, after China, I think the next big emerging market will be for AIs. So if you can figure out what the bots want to see, you can make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Paul, you're, you're working on your, your, your career as a comedian, right? We're going to start to see us all diversify, and you found a second job. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to be like her, except she's going to be making movies instead of uh, just being in your phone, you know? You know, I, I, I'm just kind of cu curious to, to you know, um, Austin, again, you know, can, can you, you know, through your experience, look at other art forms, other artists, you know, who, who have, you know, dealt with these same sort of problems and what sustenance and methods they've used to sustain themselves? Because I recently announced that I was no longer going to uh, produce films for my living because I found that it compromised my art to do so. Uh, you know, the thing that kills me uh, is that you can actually make a much more lucrative living helping other people be creative or talking about being creative than you can actually being creative. Uh, and what the I mean Dr. by that... Show? You mean I can actually start to pitch the Dr. Ted Show? <laughs> right. I mean, you know, the one of the things that... Like, I've, I'm very interested in Kickstarter because when we talk about crowdfunding... You know, it's it's really helping this whole you know group of artists get some dough for their projects and stuff. But when you step back and think about who's really benefiting from Kickstarter, it's Kickstarter. It's the people who have the platform. So one of the you know one of the suggestions I'd make to my son is build a platform. You know, because that's because yeah. that's really how you're going to make the dough. Yeah. You know? uh, uh, oh, I, I, I've never met an agent yet who did it for love. <laughs> yeah. You know, but I think what Austin's saying that's, that's so uh, ap apropos is, you know, we were saying before, you know, Minette was saying it was such a, uh, well, Minette and Ritesh both, that it was such a boost to their films to get picked up by Sony Pictures Classics. You know, we know that uh, a good review of a movie in the New York Times has more of an impact at the box office than a good review in... Uh, you know, the Houston Chronicle or, or whatever, and or some website that we haven't heard of. So I think that we're at this moment now where the, the, that in the old establishment in, in media uh, and, out, and distribution outlets and whatever is, is still the dominant force. But the question is, you know, what will be the Sony Pictures classics of web distribution? You know, I mean, the Sony classics guys have been in this business. Oh, Sandor. Yeah, no self-promotion, Ted. But the, the you know those those guys have been in this business for th for thirty plus years, so they've had a chance to, to really build a brand. And when we're talking about all everything in the, in the digital sphere, it's still very new. So you know it's kind of unfair to compare one against the other. You know the the, the you know Kickstarter is a good example of something that does seem to be here to to last now that did emerge from the new technology. So let's see what else is going to come in the in the next years. So, I, I'm a new filmmaker. Um, I'm it, not going to go to film school because I've learned, you know, from Paul Schrader and and others that it that it's a, a, a racket. I'm going to take the advice and learn how to code. Take Austin's advice and get a get a day job and try to start my own platform. Um, I'm going to speak up early and often. You know, vote, voting with my my dollars for the culture that I want, supporting underserved audiences and underheard voices. And how am I going to have time to create my own work? You know, in, in this current world, you know, what 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 are good alternatives? When we say, I know that I have something unique to say, 
that I know uh, that that I can tell stories well, you know. Uh, but I have I want to have a family and maybe own a house. What's an artist to do? That stumped him. <laughs> that <laughs> yeah, that uh, that's a conversation killer. Well, I don't know. Somebody, oh, somebody right. should have well. a pill where it, that doesn't require sleep because I get very little, and I think most of my collaborators get very little sleep because you know it's a indie film is a volume business. In order to survive, you have to continue churning out movies because if you're not making in production, you're not getting paid. So none of us get any sleep. So if somebody could invent a pill that <laughs> substitutes sleep, that would be awesome. Well, they, that does exist. Um. <laughs> you have to have the passion. I mean, you have to have the passion for this, and as everybody has said, you know, it's not necessarily a place where you're going to be making a living, but why are you doing it if you don't have this fire in your gut to do it? Because it's so much work, but the rewards on the other end, from when I talk to, you know, when I see people, when their movies are coming out is extraordinary, but really believe in yourself, believe in your stories, believe that your stories, that you have things to tell, and fight for them. Well, I know that I would pay, you know, okay, it's not a huge amount, but I'll, I'll commit now, you know, particularly if there's another thousand people to do that, to pay both Paul and Mitesh $100 a year to get whatever they're creating at the first window of opportunity. I, I would like to be able to be a patron for the, the filmmakers that, whose work I admire, and I'll take a chance because... You know, I would do that with Spike Lee, and I haven't loved every one of his movies. I would do that with Jim Jarmusch, and I haven't loved every one of his movies. How um, about any women, Ted? Oh, I, I would definitely do that with Catherine Bigelow, and I think I've loved almost every one of her movies. You know, there, there's, a, there's a slew, you know, um, there's a slew of filmmakers at every persuasion that, that I would do that with, just like I would do with musicians and artists, if you give me something more. Right now, all of the filmmakers and kind of where this conversation has addressed film as a product, you know, as a series of one-offs, you know, where we reinvent the wheel each time. The music industry has moved a bit more to a relationship model, you know, to some degree. You know, if I could buy into a long-term relationship where I felt the artist was going to serve me, I would, one, have a much bigger personal connection with that. Two, the artist would have a more balanced, you know, way of working. Um, you would have the confidence that the funding was there, and you would be free of the market constraints or the entrenchment of the gatekeepers in the subsidy system. How come we haven't had that relationship-based cultural economy? You know, uh, uh, Ted, I, I think the, the the hundred bucks a year, if you give it for for the first window of opportunity uh, to access my work, I, I think that would destroy me uh, as an artist uh, because, to some degree, it would remove sort of uh, this responsibility I would have towards you to to contemplate my work, my life, and reinvent myself as an artist with every film. Uh, because uh, because of, not, not just because of complacency, but, uh, but you would have some set expectations from me as an artist that I would have to fulfill each time if I keep wanting keep wanting to get your hundred bucks. You know, so uh, I think uh, I think the feature film form, uh, as much as it might be in a little bit of trouble now, it's it's an opportunity for uh, for a filmmaker to uh, to reimagine themselves. Uh, in a way that a short film form or, or sort of serialized television doesn't allow. Um, and, and the reason why this business and why existing in it is so challenging is, is, is exactly that. Because, uh, uh, and I think for audiences even who are interested in a filmmaker's work, um, you know, uh, they go into every film because they like his work, but they also go into it to test, test him, to see if he has been able to uh, reinvent himself in a in you know a, a positive positively gratifying way each time. Good phrase. Reinvent ourselves, Austin. You as our outsider, you want to give us some uh, final final words of uh, hope and inspiration. 
Uh, I, you know, I, I think, uh, gosh, what would I say? Uh, I think, <laughs> I think you just have to figure out a way to, um, you know, to share your, pa you know, to make your work and then, you know, get your work done and then figure out a way to share it in a way that resonates with people. And I think that's always been the job of the artist and I think it will continue to be. As yeah. much as it changes, is it stays the same. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, everyone. It, Thank I, you. I had a lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye.